Yes. Everybody, yeah. thank you for coming to uh, Brews and Breaches uh, with Dutch MSP and Line Guard. For those of you who don't know me, and most of you probably don't, I'm John Fry. I'm a channel account manager for Line Guard. And just a little bit of history, I've been in the channel for quite a few years. Uh, spent 10 years at ConnectWise, uh, did a year at Cisco, then came over to Line Guard uh, back in about the midpoint of March. So it's been a great run. And one of the things they tapped me on the shoulder to do is to really connect with our European uh, friends and distributors. And I can't say enough great things about Dutch MSP, Raymond and Diedrich and all the other um, people that I've met. Uh, not only are you guys getting things done from a technical perspective, but it really is a breath of fresh air, the way you approach life. And, um, you know, something I think that we can learn a lot about here in the States. So it's, it's been great uh, to talk to you. I always have a smile on my face when I do. Um, so that's, that's really my intro. Um, I'll hand it over to Raymond. Uh, I was on mute. Uh, do you want to do in Dutch? Or whatever you want. Ik wil, gewoon, ik wil er gewoon iedereen welkom weten. Super tof dat er zoveel mensen bij zijn. Even kijken of Bas inmiddels alweer terug is. Bas is weggevallen, maar ik zie hem niet meer terug inkomen. Ik heb hem even een berichtje gestuurd. Maar uh, ja, nee, ja, uh, uh, Scott gaat zo meteen zeg maar, het woord van ons nemen. Die gaat jullie meenemen in de presentatie. Dus de presentatie die wij al een keer eerder gezien hebben. En waar ik destijds heel erg van onder de indruk was. En dacht van ja, weet je, dit, dit lijkt me gewoon tof om dit zeg maar, met de mensen die wij kennen. Uh, de, de vriendjes die wij links en rechts tegenkomen uh, te delen. Uh, uh, vandaar dat ik jullie ook al benaderd heb van hey, uh, kom naar deze sessie, dit, dit ga je ongetwijfeld heel erg tof vinden. Uh, en vooral insight van uh, uh, wat er met KC gebeurd is, uh, bij Solomines gebeurd is, uh, Print Nightmare, noem het maar op. Dit is gewoon uh, kick-ass. Dus uh, dat dacht ik van nou, ah, ik ga jullie gewoon benaderen en uitnodigen voor deze, uh, deze webinar. I think I understood. Hey, I think I understood kick ass. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. You don't need more. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Scott. Scott, take it away. What about Diedrich? He wants to say something. Oh, Diedrich. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry mate. You no, I, just, uh, you know, I, I second that what Raymond said. And uh, the thing is, you know, in the past year, uh, uh, Lion Guard has, has taken a pretty important, you know, uh, place in our stack. So I, I think it's one of the three or four uh, <laughs> uh, pillars, uh, you know, together with the RMM and the PSA documentation and line guard. So uh, it's a, you know, it, it, it became pretty important in a short span. So that's why we wanted to introduce it to all of you to really unlock the power of, uh, of line guard. So um, yeah, looking forward to the presentation and uh, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Awesome. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Here. Awesome. <laughs> Happy to Bruise and Breaches. <laughs> uh, it is absolutely a pleasure to join you guys all with Bruise and Breaches. Um, you know, really, it's the only way I can convince my wife to let me drink at eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning here in the state. <laughs> uh, so thank you guys for having me. It definitely, I'm looking forward to cracking one open and joining it at the end. Um, I am excited to be speaking with you guys about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is IT security. And it's really all about what you can do to build a better security foundation. But try to play, pay close attention because you may think that you have all your bases covered, but I'm gonna challenge you to really step back and make sure that you have the fundamentals right. So just a little bit about me, you know, just, you know, take care of the house cleaning here. Before joining Lion Guard, uh, officially now a year ago, I spent six years working in the MSP space. I've done everything from the help desk to VCIO to director of ops, sales, and really everything in between. You know, you guys are in the MSP space. You know, I had 12 hats just like you guys did. Uh, just like you've been there, you know, and collected those hats. Before entering the MSP space, I worked enterprise IT, where I had a focus on cybersecurity and infrastructure. I have in-depth experience and knowledge with many of the international and US-based compliance and breach notification laws, including NIST, CCPA here in the United States, GDPR. I just went through Australia's Essential 8, PCI DSS, uh, other industry ones, and et cetera. In addition to LionGuard, I'm a founder of the Cybersecurity Association of Pennsylvania. I'm an adjunct professor with Harrisburg University here in Pennsylvania. And when I have time, I actually run a vlog called The Morning Breach. So please, there's no questions, you know, off the table. If you have a question, ask it, even if it's not line guard related, if it's, you know, security related, and you're really trying to figure something out, please ask it. A, 
between myself, John Fry here with Lion Guard, uh, but really the community that's here on this call, we can help you get that answer. And it's all about sharing that knowledge. I know it's late in the day um, for you guys, and I promise I want to get to that time period that we all can crack that beer open. So I don't want to waste any time. But if you do have any questions, just post it in the chat and we will take care of them at the end. That way we can fly through the presentation and get to that cold beverage. So Houston, we have a problem. These words were made famous by Jack Swigger with Apollo 13. We're here as well as the world is seeing this new surge in cyber attacks and breaches. You know, recently we've seen Kaseya's uh, cyber incident. We've had solar winds, uh, supply chain attack. You have CNA Financial, which is one of the biggest cyber insurance firms in the US. You have gas pipelines, food, the medical industry. Well, you already know, no business is safe. No industry is, you know, outside of the realms of what these cyber attackers are targeting. If you can sit here and tell me that you've not had a security incident over the last 12 months, I can tell you that you don't have the right tools in place to know that you were attacked. Even worse, the attack may have been successful and you just haven't figured it out yet. From your phishing emails, from hacked websites, from zero day attacks, your supply chain, social engineering, and more. I guarantee we all have experienced at least one of these in an attempt, if not a successful breach. The subject of IT security has been elevated to unprecedented levels. And the list that you can see of the growing types of attacks isn't going to get any smaller. You know, I remember the days when you heard about a breach every now and then. Well, technology has really expanded and has really grown. And change is the only constant. These attackers are getting more sophisticated and they're looking for the folks on this call who have left their guard down. They are after you and they're after your customers. So it's not just looking at state-sponsored cyber attacks or cyber terrorism or ransomware, malware, phishing, man in the middle. You know, you have your employee cases too. There's so many types of attacks that we have to be prepared for and think about when we're looking at planning how we're going to defend our infrastructure and our data against all the different attacks. So I like this slide here. It's, it's all about the security spectrum. And it's kind of that pre-incident versus pro in, or post-incident. And we tend as IT professionals to be on the right side of this. And it's being that reactive side. You know, I'm looking at it and, oh, I found it, I'm gonna to respond to it. I found it, I'm gonna to respond to it. And, and we go through this vicious cycle, but we never really take the time to move a little bit further over into that defense. You know, hey, we got antivirus, we got this, but have we really gotten into hardening or have you gotten over into really architecting a good cyber policy and a good plan so that hopefully we don't even get to the post-incident side of it? Reactively, reactively looks like having that advanced threats that evade multiple detection methods. You need to rely on activity logs that trigger you when something's going on. And we have to stop reacting and really get to a point that we're being proactive and we're planning so that when it happens, A, we know what needs to happen. We have that checklist ready to go. But at you know, we have to all work as a community to get to the left side of this slide. So how do you get to the left side? And almost every solution that you're familiar with in the security spectrum is post-breach. Your antivirus, your intrusion, intrusion detection, SIM solutions, you know, they're going to let you know that the bad guys have already made it in. You know, if you think your firewall is all you need, well, the walls you build to protect your fortress are permeable. Attackers will go under, they'll go around, they'll go over, they'll go through them. So you need to make sure you position and plan what you have in place across the board. You know, it's not a matter of if an attack will happen anymore, <clears throat> but it is absolutely when is that next attack or that next vulnerability going to be highlighted. And we learned that, you know, really looking at the recent Kaseya incident. You know, just out of the blue, you know, people started getting locked out of their Kaseya RMM environments 
And at first, you know, really no one knew what was going on. Um, you know, it didn't take long for Kaseya to realize, hey, there's an issue, and they started shutting down the cloud services, uh, communicating out to the community of, hey, if you're running that local system, you know, for the RMM, you got to shut it down because we don't know what's going on yet. But it's really about, you know, A, making sure that your code is secure, regular testing of it, validating, verifying, but really getting to the root cause. And, you know, at first there was conversations of, oh, did someone have their password breached? You know, was it a siloed incident? Was it just one MSP or was it two MSPs? You know, it's really trying to figure out that root cause. And at the end of the day, any tool that you deploy within your stack or to your customers, you should be responsible for the security of that application. It shouldn't be, well, you know, Scott at LionGuard says it's safe, so I trust him at his word. You know, validate it. You know, I can provide you, you know, our security documentation. We're going through and updating our DPA right now, um, you know, just because so much of it has changed since the last time the DPA was written. So there's so much that if you're not taking the time to validate the vendors that you're working with or the vendors that your clients are working with, you're never going to get, you know, to that left side of that bank. <clears throat> and ultimately, you're going to look like this guy here. And this is that today's IT landscape. It's complex and you're managing data scattered all over the place. Each of the systems that you support has its own portal, reporting, alerting. You have to look at them individually. You know, often it's tenant by tenant or customer by customer. It's nearly impossible to keep up with everything. Why would you ever want to keep up with all these things the hard way? Well, for one, you don't want to sacrifice your profit, but you need to be able to rely on accurate information on your customers and the systems you support with data that you can actually trust. There's just not enough cycles in the day, even with the best engineers out there to make it happen. You have to have visibility into all these systems all across your stack. And while you continue to grow and scale, your team is gonna get overwhelmed. They're gonna get stressed. And ultimately they're not gonna be able to keep it up, keep up with it all. And that's why at nine o'clock Eastern time, we're all sitting back having drinks right now because we're so stressed out over pulling our hair out trying to make this work. Now it's nine o'clock my time. I know it's what, three o'clock your time. Um, so, you know, it's more appropriate, but you know, it's all about, you know, there's only so much you can take mentally and physically until you just need that escape of, oh, good God, I just, I need to clear my mind. <clears throat> the days of the traditional network perimeter and, you know, being this siloed security, they're gone. You know, what doesn't work is manual processes, manual discovery and documentation. It's incapable of providing the detail and the frequency necessary to get ahead of the problem. I mean, let's be honest. If you go into your documentation system, choose any one of the clients, you know, when was the last time that data was updated? When was the last time the server information was updated or the firewall information was updated? When was the last time there was a check done to make sure the best practices that you want followed on your firewall setups is actually still there. The amount of times that I saw port 3389 open up across all the different networks that I helped consult with at the beginning of COVID was just mind boggling of why IT people thought it was the fastest way to open up people from working at home. It's like, I get it, you need to give capability, but you have to do it securely. The manual correlation of data from rapidly expanding number of different systems and services, that just, it's not going to scale. You know, there's not one solution out there that you can just say, okay, this is $5,000, I'm gonna spend $5,000 and it's guaranteeing I'm not gonna get a breach. The product doesn't exist. And the more systems that you add on to kind of layer interior security stance, it's good, but you also have to be aware of what you're trying to patch in that, you know, that whole stack that you have, your security stack, because you just don't want to put money out there. Because so often with security tools, what we see is you're adding a tool because it says it does this, but you never fully configure it to do what it says it does. So now you have two tools doing the exact same thing and neither of them are set up correctly. And all it's doing is opening up additional holes in your, you know, your defenses. One-time audits and reviews just are no longer sufficient to keep up with the rapid changes in our own ecosystems. Um, you know, I think the, the most popular one that I can think of is I was a Cisco Meraki shop when we were an MSP. 
And for whatever reason, my lower level text, anytime someone complained about internet slowness, they had it in their mind that they had to log into Meraki and turn off intrusion prevention. And it was like this conversation that they kept having of it fixes the issue. And, you know, I kept coming back and saying, do not turn this off to the point that I actually had to start disabling their access to Cisco Meraki. Um, but it happened, but it's how many times does it happen or how many times does someone make a change trying to fix an issue and doesn't change it back to see if that really was the root cause? You know, when I'm going ticket to ticket, when I'm trying to flow through 30, 40 tickets a day, you know, I'm fixing it. Okay, you're good. Perfect. I'm done. I'm moving on. Close the ticket. Sometimes I may put notes in there that I turned it off. Sometimes I may not. But doing these one-time audits means you're not going to find out about it until the next time someone logs into that system and says, oh, wow, that's turned off. That's not good. Or you do that one-time audit when you have time to do it. What does work is the unification and automation. They're necessary to detect the potential exposures in your customer security posture. This is the era of cloud and internet of things. If we're not looking to automate the processes that do the tedious, mind blogging, crazy, time consuming you know, processes, then you're, you're gonna be stuck in this manual world and you're not going to give your clients the peace of mind and the security that they deserve. MSPs must provide a management plan that addresses these potential threats from both the seen and the unseen sources before they arise. And at the root of it all, data is king. When we look at misconfigurations of data, you know, this is something else that we see so often. It's, you know, going halfway through the, the setup or getting something and a security change, you know, a security firmware update changes something and you have to go in and change it. You know, firewalls aren't the forget it and, you know, set it and forget it devices that they were before. We have to make sure that we're keeping them updated, making sure that, you know, usernames that don't need to be in there aren't in there, making sure that new usernames aren't added by someone that's creating a backdoor. Um, you know, or there's insufficient firewall rules that are no longer being used or misapplied DNS filtering. You have to make sure your AV, your malware, your security tools, you know, are updated. You know, when's the last time you validated your backup disaster recovery works? You know, I did quarterly checks with each one of our customers to make sure that, you know, if a situation came up that I could restore just a file or an entire server. So making sure you're going through those drills, making sure you're going through those tests. But I'll be honest with you, if you're on the reactive side of the bubble, you don't have time for that. It's not until you can make that transition to being proactive that then you can say, okay, we're going to budget time for this now, this now, this now, because being proactive is going to give you that time back. Automating that data collection and data monitoring is going to give you that time back. You have configuration drift or, you know, that too often we fix something only for it to be unfixed later. You know, just like I used the example a minute ago with the Cisco Meraki and the intrusion detection, you know, making sure that someone's fix doesn't need to be unfixed later and getting that visibility into those configuration changes are absolutely crucial. So data is king. And, you know, I'm going to say that I think a few more times as we go through this presentation. And you know, it's extremely helpful when you're being that proactive MSP to be able to predict what your threats are or what your weaknesses are. But it's just the tip of the iceberg. Regardless of the system, whether it's the coolest SaaS product out there, the coolest server, the most expensive file store in the cloud, network device, whatever, configurations must be continuously and correctly documented. It enables your MSP to remain alert to any changes and being agile enough to correct them in a timely manner. I mean, if you think about it, there are some of the examples. You know, we talked drift of configurations, but multi factor authentication, DMARC, DKIM, you know, these are policies and, and um, you know, not policies, but they're services that have been out there for a while. But even when I'm going through, and running tech evals or going through demos and I'm asking MSPs across the globe, are you using MFA yet? I still sometimes get the answer of no, 
or when I'm getting ready to jump on a call and I just do a quick, you know, look at the domain name and I see that DMARC, DKIM, and there's no SPF record on the domain. You know, if we can't take the simple things with our own business, with our own kind of domain for security, then what faith do you, I have as you providing, you know, my business, that level of security you're talking about. When I was in sales or when I was jumping in and helping sales at the MSP, I always went in with that information. Like if I knew for a fact that my leading competitor didn't have DMARC and DKIM set up, absolutely, I was highlighting the point. It's like, look, you know, you know, I understand you don't know what DKIM is, but you know, a rough example, you know, this is really to help secure your domain from malicious emails. Well, this vendor that came in here and pitched this to you, they don't even have that set up. Here's the proof. And this is why we set it up for you. So you're actually more secure than this potential vendor that you're looking at. You know, nothing gets eyes open more when you highlight the security weaknesses of some of your competitors. And especially when you've told them about it, because you know, you don't want to be that vicious person. It's like, look, I'm telling you up front, you, you should have DKIM and DMARC enabled. If you don't want to do it, cool. But if you don't do it, I'm going to use it against you. You know, it's all about the community as a whole improving and helping each other. But at the same time, if you can't protect your house and you don't have the data and the information to know what to do to protect your house, then ultimately when you're breached, it's on you. It's not some vendor's fault. It's not this. It's your fault. And it all starts with that data. So when I look at, you know, the standardized, the scalable and secure outcomes, you know, data leads to insights, which leads to the high impact outcomes. Data warehousing and data aggregation are key. Your insights are going to lead to new opportunities. They're going to help you close the vulnerabilities. And ultimately, it leads to that high impact outcomes, which is better reporting for your billing, reconciliation, uh, your quarterly business reviews or whatever you call them, onboarding processes, assessments, your onboarding, ongoing audits, being able to scale across customer environments, across systems and services. This is absolutely crucial. Now, I've said data is king a few times. And the reason I say that is at the end of the day, you can't secure what you don't know. One of the favorite exercises I did during onboardings uh, and I did onboardings in typically two to four hours after I had line guard in place at the MSP, but I would sit down and I'd go around to different departments and I'd have conversations with them while we were true methods. So while my net admin actually went around and installed line guard and, you know, took pictures and stuff, but I would sit down with employees and have conversations. Okay. Where are you storing your data? How are you doing this? How are you doing that? You know, really getting to know each department and how they kind of function. And typically what I came out of that is, Sales loved OneDrive, uh, marketing loved Dropbox, so-and-so used box.com to store things, so-and-so you know, had a remote desktop tool that wasn't authorized, but I'd get all this information and I'd be able to go back and within 30 days in my state of IT report to the customer, you know, with the help of LionGuard's data and insights, I'd go back within 30 days, present to them all the issues that they have, all the data that I've collected, and oftentimes the response was, you know more about my network in 30 days than the last vendor did in multiple years. But more importantly, is I'd be able to say, all right, you're my point of contact. You're the CEO of the organization here. Where's your data at? Like if a breach occurs, where's your data at? And they're like, it's on the server. I'm like, do you have any outside of the environment? No, everything's on my server. And I've heard that so many times and you guys have probably too. But in reality, marketing is using Dropbox. I have sales is using OneDrive. You know, they don't think about the services that they have or where their data potentially lives when it leaves the office. And we saw that dramatically shift and change with the start of COVID-19 because now not just employees were looking for an easy way to work at home, but you had IT departments sometimes struggle to give them the fast and easy access to the data in a secure fashion. That opened up a ton of security vulnerability, be it port 3389, not secure VPN tunnels, or anything in between. But like I said, it all comes down to that root cause of you cannot protect what you don't know you have. And one of the core things that is our responsibility as 
you know, the trusted IT partner or provider is being able to know what they have, where their data is. So if something does happen to it, we have the capability of at least having a plan laid out or knowing at least where the data is to begin with. So earlier, I showed you guys this slide here, this guy pulling his head out, getting ready to go have that drink because he's just completely stressed out of everything that's going on. And this is really what a good unified visibility and automation platform can provide to you. Now, obviously I'm talking about LionGuard here, but you know, whatever it may have been, you know, in this case, LionGuard, being able to grab 70 plus inspectors or systems that you have out there, being able to grab insights from that, being able to bring them all together, put them into one portal so that you can sort it, you can export it, you can report on it, you can view what you have across your platform, across all of your customers. Being able to standardize on those configurations and documentation, being able to create metrics and actionable alerts that alert you when a change occurs, be it port 3389 open or intrusion detection turned off or random technician creates a backdoor username on random server or a new user was added to Active Directory or a new computer was added into Active Directory, sometimes without you knowing. And if they're adding computers on their own, you have to make sure you're securing them. But at the end, it's all about allowing you to scale your business. The true benefit of an automation platform like LionGuard is it's giving everyone in your organization time back in their day. And when I say everyone, I mean everybody. It's giving your technicians time back because now you're making that transition to being more proactive and you're getting more insights before they become issues of the customer calling. So the technicians aren't as stressed. They're able to go through things a little bit faster. You can also customize the body of those messages and include scope of work or uh, um, SO, um, yeah, um, SOPs, standard operating procedures on how to resolve issues. So you can build all this stuff right into that ticket body. You can also put the data that they need. So now they're not scouring, looking for what they need before they even start working on the ticket. It saves your higher level engineers time because they're not getting tickets escalated to them because of proper SOPs that are written and processes now that are being followed by line guard automating and checking this stuff. You're saving time for your VCI host because now they're not going out and searching for this data before they put together their QBR. Your onboarding team saves time because now they're not going out and manually examining everything that they have looking for issues. They're going out, they're installing LionGuard and letting LionGuard analyze what's there and tell you what's wrong. And now you can go back to the office and dig through all those configuration changes. All the data that LionGuard collects can be pushed out into your documentation platforms like IT Blue or Hoodoo. We're pushing it over into your ticketing systems. Uh, there's five different ticketing systems that we push over data to, or you can even push it over into BrightGauge or Power BI uh, or your own custom API as we have a REST API. So you can pull data out of LionGuard and really manipulate it to do what you need it to do. At the end of the day, LionGuard is that data repository, that change management tool that's really going to open up and give your entire team back that time that they need. And you know, I mentioned all the tech positions, but what about your billing person? How many times does your billing person have to call you and say, hey, how many licenses does so-and-so have? How many are they using? With LionGuard, we pull that licensing information back when the licenses expire, how many users are using it, how many users are, how many licenses aren't being used. So you can make sure that your licensing is in line and you're not having the customer pay for more licenses than they need. So I'm gonna show you guys a quick demo and let me switch my screen here. So again, this is going to be a quick overview. I'm going to highlight just a couple of things, but I really do recommend taking a look more in depth by doing a one-on-one -on -one demo. Uh, but if there are questions in the last kind of 15 minutes, I will come back and I can show you guys different things. But when I look at LineGuard itself, this is my home, this is my kind of my home dashboard. So I have all of my environments. My environments are my customers. This is also how LionGuard bills. So it's a flat rate per environment. Doesn't matter how many users, it doesn't matter if your clients are connecting in, doesn't matter how many systems they have, environments are your customers. 
your total systems are all the different systems or the inspectors that are being used. That could be Microsoft 365, Cisco Meraki, Sonic Walls, HP Program Switches, et cetera. <coughs> your open alerts, that is the actionable alerts that are triggered to report inside of LionGuard. And the nice thing is, is as you add systems, a lot of the systems actually will discover other systems. For example, if you add an internet domain and it says, oh, there's an SSL certificate on this, it's going to discover the SSL certificate. The other thing that you'll see is we have a lot of what's known as parent child inspectors, which we're using your partner level accounts. So like Microsoft 365 or Cisco Meraki or Sentinel One, we're tying into your partner level access and we're giving you the capability of setting it up once and then mapping your customers over. So when you're onboarding that new customer, it's not just, you know, setting it up brand new. It's okay. I get them added into Sentinel one. I go into line guard. I map them over. I'm now getting the insights from Sentinel one. So what I like to show here is I'm going to go over to systems and I'm going to highlight our internet domain DNS. So here you can see in, in our lab environment, we have 94 domains and I'm going to come over to this metrics tab. And I want to know just domains that do not have SPF and DMAR. So I'm going to change this to contains false. And now I have a list of all four of the domains that do not have an SPF and DMARC record tied into it. I can come here, I can export it, drop that on my engineer's desk, and he can say, okay, these are the domains that I need to get SPF and DMARC set up on. I can come in and let's see, say for example, we'll say GoDaddy had a security breach and I need everybody that has a GoDaddy account to change their password. So same thing, I go to godaddy.com, I go through, here's my list, I can come up here, I can export and it's going to show me and tell me who has GoDaddy so I can get a hold of them, let them know what needs done. You also see there's MX records, et cetera, the real power though is the fact that you can select the metrics that are important to you so say for example the admin contact you know is important for me to see i can come in here and add the admin contact or if i want to see the dns sec records i can come in here and see who's using dns sec so any of the data that we collect is inside a data print that data print is read by metrics which are james path queries and from there, you can report on them throughout the platform and customize what you need to see. But let's dig into the domain Contoso.com, Microsoft's favorite fake company. And what I'm gonna show you guys here is all the information that really you would need to know to manage this domain. So I got right up top, I have this timeline. This is my historical change management timeline. Um, so it's going to alert to me anytime system changes. So here I can see on 722, two changes occurred. I'm going to go back in time. Now I'm looking at the data from here. I can see I have two changes and I can see registering contact changed and the DNS admin contact. Now, if I go to 723, it's probably showing me going from null back to Microsoft. If we go back over to system details, you have the capability of adding notes what i've used notes for in the past is hey i'm getting ready to do a web server migration or i'm getting ready to do a server upgrade you know just tying notes to the timeline to correlate to what some of these changes are or here you can see note for scott on this timeline entry you know sample text whatever down below is you have your data so <coughs> here i can see the domains contoso.com it's registered at mark monitor domain created, updated, you know, the simple stuff you would expect to see. We're digging into the DNS information, your hosting region, your A records, name servers, even going into your website, showing you your website region, your website hosting vendor, is TLS SSL there? Looking at your SPF, your DMAR, even who is that hosting vendor for your email and what the MX record is. But the root of it all comes in with this DNS tab. That's going to show you all the records, where it points, and even where it resolves to. And the reason I like doing this example in these demos is simply because we've all dealt with the web guy that refuses to give the keys to the kingdom because he believes he's the almighty web developer guy. And he changes servers sometimes without telling you. He makes changes without calling us. And what happens is he forgets to copy over a VPN doc or the MX record. We've all been there. We've all seen it. 
we've all gotten those phone calls from the customer saying my domain's not working my you know nothing's working i can't connect anymore and you know you start troubleshooting you you know but so oftentimes you go back and you say oh someone made a change to your mx record and that's why email's not working anymore um but before you get that you probably spent 30 maybe an hour going through troubleshooting that workstation when really LionGuard had the answer. So it is important to kind of be aware. And sometimes it's those basic issues or the basic uh, solutions that solve some of the complex issues. And where LionGuard really benefits with this, and if I go to say, I'm gonna go over to environments here and go to Contoso. So I'm gonna to go to the Contoso Nation environment dashboard. And what I have the capability of doing is coming down here into my environment admin inspectors, choosing all 82 of the inspectors, all 80 devices that I have in play and actually running them at once. So this was step one for my techs when they were doing triage to be able to come in and quickly identify changes that may have occurred doing a manual run outside of the automation schedule to see what has changed since the last time the inspector ran. You give it five, 10 minutes, you come back, you now have the triage information and the insights to say, oh, the firewall configuration changed. Oh, the internet domain information changed. And that really is what opens up the door to being able to speed up that process in resolving tickets. Now, the other inspector that I like to show is our Microsoft 365 inspector. Why? Because, well, it's Microsoft and for the most part, everyone's using 365 and at least one or multiple users or um, tenants. You have the timeline, you have your notes. But when I look at the overview tab, I can see my domain name, my secure score. So here I can see this environment has the 17.25 out of the 64 maximum for this uh, tenant. My active users, I can see unlicensed users, assigned user summary, what licenses are being used. But really when I dig into the licensing tab itself, this is where your billing person's gonna love you because it's quickly, I can say, oh, Enterprise E5, I have 10 active, but I'm only using eight licenses. So now it's that phone call to the customer. Hey, I see you have two extra licenses of E5. We can actually discontinue those and actually save you some money uh, when your next bill. So, you know, that's awesome. But if you need us to keep it because you're hiring someone, you know, we can do that too. You can see, you know, mobility e EMS premium, you know, seven assigned, you know, only 10 are active. Um, but being able to break down those licenses or even licenses by users, I don't understand it, but I have seen where a technician adds business premium onto a user that already had 365. Uh, so they have kind of now two exchange licenses or two office 365 licenses. I have seen it and you know, this is a great little summary. And again, it's all exportable into that CSV format. So you can kind of manipulate data there. Breaking down users, being able to see if they're privileged, MFA status, what their licensed products are. Have they been active in the last 30 days? Um, we can dig into roles, groups, your mailbox information, such as storage use, quota warning, you know, being able to quickly identify, you know, what the issues are. I love the secure scores tab for two reasons. One, it's going to give me my MFA. So here I can see MFA registration V2. So out of my 12 users, you know, nine of them do not have MFA set up. Or here I can see my admin account, my admin MFA V2. One user does not have MFA set up. Or my other one that I love pointing out because we all have to go, you know, disable this. And if you don't, I highly recommend this is your takeaway. Go into 365 and start disabling the block legacy authentication. Uh, so your older office clients like 2010 and older, you know, they still may use IMAP, SMTP and POP3, but really 2010 and newer, it's all exchange format. So unless you have a scanner that's doing scan to email over SMTP, you don't need IMAP, SMTP and POP3 open for these anymore. So go through and disable those legacy authentications. Here you can see I have 12 evaluated items. All 12 of my users are in breach because it's not disabled for these users. You can see your domains, organizations, what SharePoint applications you have going or what applications, OAuth 2 permissions even, your service principles, here's your SharePoint sites, uh, and getting into contracts. Um, like I said, everything comes into this big data print file and it's, you know, that JSON file is showing you everything that's going on within. That's my roles. 
sites, users, uh, you know, if I expand down on users, I can see more about in here. It's uh, Alan DeYoung, just a member, blah, blah, blah. So any data that's inside the data print can be created into a metric. You can filter it down pretty granular. And then from there, you can create that action alert with the custom thresholds that you need to make sure you're not creating the added noise into your platform. So with that, I think we have 15 minutes left. Um, so before I do the questions, I'm going to flip back and hit one more slide, and then we're going to do Q&A. So standardizing, scaling, scalable, and secure outcomes, you know, your data is going to lead to insights, which is going to lead to your high impact outcomes, such as you know, being able to have the data so that you can tell the customers what needs fixed or what needs to be worked on to give them a better security experience. It's going to save you time with billing, reconciliation, your QBRs, onboarding, assessments, your ongoing audits. Being able to quickly scale new customers in because now all your techs have more time because they're not doing the tedious work of documentation and trying to analyze what configurations are wrong. Being able to standardize that documentation of your environments, you know, that's going to lead to faster implementations, faster support response, standardized configuration. And just because you have the ability to implement numerous types of IT security measures doesn't mean you need to over, doesn't mean you shouldn't overlook the basics. Because at the same time, the criminals know oftentimes we're so high focused on the biggest threats that we leave the key underneath the carpet to the door to walk right in. So with that, thank you guys. There is my contact information if you guys do want to connect with me or have any questions outside of this call. But John, uh, I saw the chat window pop up a few times. I'd love to see what kind of questions came in. Yeah, um, some of it was in Dutch. I think it was just uh, Raymond and Diedrich throwing some, some words in there. But you know, one thing I think that might be beneficial for the group, um, we're looking at a group that's all on auto task. Can you touch upon some of the ways that LionGuard and Autotask kind of talk back and forth to each other? Yeah, so with Autotask, I, I, I used Autotask. Uh, that was my uh, PSA when I was at the um, MSP. Uh, absolutely loved it. Uh, so Autotask is going to send tickets, or LionGuard is going to send tickets into Autotask. Um, we will update the tickets. Uh, so you can start with like a 30-day you know, internet domains coming up and then at 15 days escalated to a high priority and then turn it into a critical priority ticket. Uh, so it's pretty much with Autotask, all we're doing is sending those tickets so that you can report on it. You can select the queue that you want it to go to. Uh, you also, if you have co-managed customers, you have the capability of sending alerts just for that customer to them or what I've helped set up a couple of times now is setting up that billing at yourdomain.com so that anything that has to do with billing is actually going over to billing so that they can get the billing right. And I think all everybody in, the, in this, meet, uh, this webinar is also on IT Glue and it's probably nice to point out your integration with uh, IT Glue as well. Yeah, IT Glue is crucial. And here, I'll just, uh, I'll pull that up quick. Uh, and I also used, uh, I also used IT Glue. Uh, I think we were one of the first hundred customers to sign up with IT Glue. Um, but if I go into Contoso Nation, <coughs> A, if you're using the domain tracker inside of IT Glue to give you those reports of when domains are coming up, A, it's a blanket statement. If the domain's coming up to renew, you're getting that alert. There's no advanced filtering or anything like that. I know GoDaddy is notorious for waiting until day zero to renew that domain. So if you try to set up multiple alerts, you're creating noise for your support team. Um, so, you know, here's that domain tracker that has, that's IT glue built in. It's giving you the A, the MX, you know, it's giving you your base who is information. When I come down and I look at the line guard information and you can tell out of the box, we put this uh, parenthesis auto at the end of it. So if I go back into Contoso Nation, you know, I have a link to LionGuard, you have the domain register, you know, a lot of the same information, but you also have all those tables of that deep insight, that deep intelligence that we're gathering from the internet domain inspector. So here's and it's your constantly, email overview. It's constantly out to update, updated, right? And yes, and that's the, you know, other thing. When I look here at the revision section, I can see that July 26th, July 25th, July 24th, it is being updated. The internet domains can be updated every four hours. The majority of our domains are once every eight hours, uh, but they all have a default setting of once a day. 
Um, so, but being able to know that this information is current, being able to know that it was last revised, that is absolutely crucial for you because now you can trust those records. It's not that the technician put it in a year ago and said they were with GoDaddy, but they changed to Dotster or something. You know, being able to know what they have, how they have it. And we do the same thing with every one of our inspectors. If I look at Active Directory for on-prem, I can see it's a 2012 R2 domain. I can see the recycle bins enabled. I can see who my privileged users are. Tony Stark, he really shouldn't be a privileged user um, for whatever reason, he just insisted on it. Um, you know, you can see he's in the admin group. He's not in the domain or enterprise admin group though. Uh, what my servers are. And you can even customize what you see here. Say for example, you don't wanna know what the account lockout is. You can actually turn those fields off and just see the other fields. So you do have the capability of customizing the way the data looks inside IT Blue as well. Um, but the root of it is we create new flexible assets. So the data from LionGuard, every time we sync the data with the inspector, we're pushing it over into IT Woo for you. So you don't have to change your processes or policies, you know, still make IT Woo that source of record, let LionGuard feed that source of information for you. So Scott, are you saying that instead of having billable resources put data into IT Glue, that LionGuard could do it for them? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. That's fantastic. Um, we did get a, a question from Paul. So is LionGuard read only or does it solve issues it detects? We are read only. So we are not writing anything. In fact, we start with zero trust with every one of our inspectors. Um, so we only want that read only access to those that we can have it for. Um, some of the devices like your sonic wall firewalls, we SSH to, so we need admin rights to it. <coughs> but any of the APIs, any of the newer inspectors, we're pulling read only access to it. And we're about giving you the data so that you can you know, turn around and resolve the issues the way you see fit to resolve those issues, but setting the thresholds also in a way that makes sense to you as a business. Good stuff. You know, I think part of what we accomplished today is to show that line guard does quite a bit more than I think what people think it does, right? So a lot of people come out of the gates and this is probably a lot of our fault, especially as we started, you know, we're, we're not just documentation we're not just an add on to IT glue. We do so much more. The challenge is really focusing on what's important. We're doing a much better job communicating that. So hopefully that's a nice takeaway from the group today. And one thing yeah. I, I, I might want to add to uh, the question of Paul um, is that although LineGuard doesn't really solve issues, you can create a custom metric with a custom threshold and then uh, create a ticket and order task with a nice description of the issue because you already know what the what the problem is uh, and you can add the solution uh, into that ticket body as well so you can just you know give your text uh, an instruction how to solve a particular issue and link to a knowledge base article or anything so it's it's the next best thing i'd say absolutely, absolutely. it looks like uh actually, i'd like to hear from the group any current users any sort of use cases or just comments in general about line guard you'd like to share with the group that'd be great well the thing that we did and i think it's similar to like i, I, I can uh, uh give myself give myself compliments but this is something that uh we learned from the guys at compi is that we started to define our best practices within multiple services that we deliver and and you uh, start small don't go for the holy grail at once start small and just say, like he said, Daykim, Daymark. Just say, all right, let's check with our customers. Is Daykim, Daymark uh, well configured? And it will say, all right, uh, because everybody makes mistakes, right? It can be a small, mistake, a small mistake by one of our engineers. And Lion God will point it out. We'll create a ticket in, uh, in, uh, in our task and we have, have a look at it and we fix it. So we started to do like, um, how, do you, how do you call it? Um, Standardization, standardize, standardize everything across the board, and that's uh, uh, where line guards, uh, line guard comes in place. It's we define our best practices, our best practices, how we do uh, our shit, and then check it among all our customers. Gotcha. Um, maybe that's, that's absolutely crucial. Just to add into that, you know, I did the exact same thing at the MSB, and you know, line guard became my best practice analyzer. You know, we all use the BPA with Microsoft. You know but LionGuard became that BPA for every device that I had. 
you know, my firewalls, my switches and everything. You know, I need to know what firmware versions were out there because there was a firmware update with this switch. Okay, I knew now which ones I had to go in and update. You know, it became that best practice analyzer, but also it helped me with change management, change management and that change management timeline. You're getting more and more people more aware of the compliance requirements that are there. The cyber or the cybersecurity insurance industry is looking for things now that are tied to compliance requirements. Change management is popping up more and more. Being able to provide that is another huge takeaway that LionGuard offers. <clears throat> for us, it helped fulfill the promise we made to our customers. Like <laughs> we made a big promise to the customers years ago. And uh, time after time, we found ourselves uh, like not looking at, I, I can give a, a thousand examples, not looking at this, not looking at that. And th when the moment comes, uh, when be that becomes a problem, the, uh, it's like, yeah, mm, shit, we didn't see it, shit, we didn't see it. So, uh, but we promised we would, like, because we know we should, and this is automating that, that and not leaving it to the engineers to do it day in, day out. Let the system check it, and only if it's uh, if there's Delta, let us know. I will have a look. So Raymond and Diedrich, um, what other things would you, uh, as you know, users of the platform, used it for mm -hmm. a little while, what other areas in terms of inspectors or other things that you're looking for LionGuard to do? What, what are some things you want to see on a roadmap? And they might even be there. Ooh, it's a nice one. Maybe I can tap my colleague Mark there. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. I got some ideas. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we put a few ideas in the ideas uh, portal. Um, and, and basically what we want is some of the inspectors are a bit limited at the moment. So they don't go as deep as we would like them to go. Uh, for example, we... Yeah, for, yeah, Fortinet is a really good example. Uh, we're really missing some settings here. And I believe it's also more of a bug than really a missing feature. Uh, because before OS 6.2, the LineGuard inspector did retrieve all the data. Uh, it would have, but it, it no longer does. Um, and we've had that issue open for quite a while now. So I would really hope to see that on the roadmap um, uh, sometime soon. And uh, it's the same with Office 365. We're really missing some uh, security and compliance checks that have been released in the past year and a half by Microsoft that we would really like to see in the uh, LineGuard inspector as well. But overall, uh, we're really happy with the product. It's it's great. And it allows us to check our entire cloud stack in one platform, which is really, uh, really nice. But I don't think any other tool does that. Yeah, I think uh, Mark brought up a great thing is the ideas portal. And anytime I talk about the ideas portal, I, I always remind everyone that our development team, they're not in your shoes. They're not an MSP person. You know, some of them have worked at MSPs, but they're a developer. Um, so when they're going in and they're writing that inspector, when they're building that out, they're building what they believe that you need. Um, so when you're creating those ideas, the more information that you can add in, it's great. It's the same thing that you ask of your customers when they're putting in a support ticket. You know, if you can put a link into the API, or if you can say, these are the API calls that I need to see, and this is why I need to see it, you know, that adds to the, you know, capability of them, but it also saves them the time of finding that API command what data you need, why you need it. So being able to explain that to the developers is absolutely crucial as we're building out and updating these inspectors. Uh, the turnaround is great. There's a lot of great things coming uh, in the roadmap. Um, you know, every once in a while, you're going to see, you know, Fortinet, you know, not excluded, um, an API update or a firmware changes that changes, you know, access to something. And it breaks things that LineGuard collects. You know, I see it on a regular basis. You know, Microsoft, specifically where their graph API and how they just on a whim will change things. Um, so, I mean, our dev team is great at, you know, identifying those, but when you see something, use that ideas portal, because that's where our dev team gets their brilliance. Yeah. And they don't go into a black hole when you send stuff there. I know other vendors that that might be the case, but it's kind of refreshing, especially coming from some of the places I've been where ideas go into ideas portal and, you know, they get attention. Um, there's, I know we're kind of running short on time here. There's two links I put into the chat. Number one, if you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one demo, there's a link to sign up for the one-on-one -on -one demo. If you're ready to go, you're ready to sign up. There's also a link for that. So take a look for those links in the chat. 
Yeah, and if I may add, if you want to take a look at it, you know, in a live environment, live-ish or live use cases at, you know, one of our, at, at Compi or NSO, that's, um, that's fine too for you, you know, sign up or trial it yourself. Cool All right. Time. Well, Is with that, I'm going to give this. I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to say badonked. Did I get that right? <laughs> close enough. Close enough. Close enough. All right. All right. I'll take it, guys. Let's it's been a pleasure. Beers. Thank you all. Yes. Thank you um, very much. Thank you much, uh, everybody. Um, again, there's links for you to follow up on. As I mentioned, uh, please reach out to the great fine gentleman at Dutch MSP uh, as well. If you have further questions, or you can contact me. Look me up on LinkedIn, John Fry at Lionguard.